Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Barney. I graduated Bennington College in 2018 and I wanted to talk to you today about the issue of democracy on Bennington College campus. Um, excuse me first of all if I'm a little bit awkward in any of this, um, but the, <clears throat> the last time I did any sort of public speaking was in the form of a eulogy for a, a friend who had taken her own life a few years ago and unfortunately the suicide of another friend a year ago has forced me in many ways to speak out and to give this talk. I want to talk about democracy on Bennington College campus and I want to talk about Bennington College's history. Um, this talk is for current students and alumni who I think are probably equal parts in the dark, current students not knowing, uh, not being taught anything about uh, Bennington's foundational goals in uh, direct communal governance and alumni probably not knowing unless you have a student there what has happened in the last the last administration under Marco Silver uh, what what detrimental things have happened to Bennington's um, program in terms of student governance there is no there's none anymore Bennington High School has a student government and a student president, but Bennington College somehow doesn't. And that was never the intent, and uh, I, I want to take that time, I want to take the time to explain that. But this talk is also for administrators, current administrators, who either have zero working knowledge of Bennington's foundational aims or don't care, have zero concern with upholding them or defending them or instituting them. Bennington's first six decades was founded on a living, breathing constitution. That's not a joke. There was a Bennington communal community constitution. And I want to give the administration the benefit of the doubt and believe that you know they don't, in their personal politics, believe in voter suppression. But you would have no way of knowing, based on the way they've systematically dismantled every aspect of democracy on Benning Bennington College campus, every single aspect of suffrage, there is nothing anymore that falls under the purview of uh, student agency, student freedom in the community. And it's come to the point, it's deterior deteriorated to the point where uh, it has become a matter of life and death. And I, and I'm, I know that might sound outlandish, but it's, it's true, and I want to explain that. I want to explain a case that I saw personally, and I want to drive home to everybody that if you are not participating, if you're not allowed to participate in community governance in a cooperative democratic body on Bennington campus, which was its foundational purpose, then you are not protected. If you're not able to participate, you're not protected by the administration. There's no guarantee of due process. There's no guarantee of fairness in terms of disciplinary hearings. Few, the community, okay, the bulk of the community, students, cannot write community standards, have no right to assent or dissent against community standards, have no pathway through democratic processes to change community standards, then you, the community, are not protected. I want to begin just by uh, comparing two um, policies at Bennington College, of Bennington College. This is the right of entry policy from 1982, and this was written by um, a cooperative body of student faculty uh, and staff. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read it for you. The college recognizes the importance that students attach to the privacy of their rooms. It intends that any right of entry shall be exercised only when required for purposes of health, safety, and maintenance and to regulate the, uses of its, the, the use of its premises in accordance with college rules and regulations, but consistent with the constitutional right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure. The college does not intend to enter a student's room without 24-hour notice, except in the case of an emergency or other circumstances where advance notice is not feasible in view of the pressing need for entry. All entry into student rooms must be approved by the director or associate director of student affairs. So this, this is the voice of, of authority back in, in 1982, in the 80s in, in Bennington. This is a time 
when there is a community constitution that governs all their uh, policy craftings, governs how they write community standards. And you, you see it's, it's a respecting, unobtrusive, cooperative uh, voice. And this is the first time that a policy like this had to be written um, in, in Bennington's uh, history. Now let's look at how the policy stands today, written by an authority without cooperative government with students involved. Right to enter. Bennington College reserves the right of college personnel to enter any college building or space within that building, including student rooms at any time to respond to an emergency, monitor health and safety standards, and or compliance with college rules and policies, make repairs, perform cleaning, maintenance or inventory, conduct uh, an inspection or search, enforce college rules and regulations, secure buildings, and for any reasonable purpose as determined by the college. The residence's absence will not prevent such entry, nor is consent required. What you, what you have here is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a marked change. So apparently, any college personnel, even a cleaning person, can enter your room without your consent, without your awareness, and without even your presence. And this, of course, was written by... Uh, a small minority of the community, that is the administration without student participation, without student oversight, and without consulting students. And the question I want to ask today, among other ones, is how, do, how did Bennington get from A to B? How did it get from um, the right of entry policy as you see it in the 80s to the one that it has today? Is this progress? Bennington considers itself a progressive an institution of progressive education. Is this progress? It was founded by New Deal progressives, and that was the right of entry policy of a progressive institution in the 80s. Is this progress and is this Bennington? <clears throat> I would be remiss uh, in all of this if I didn't uh, point out the work of, uh, that Ron Cohen contributed to. Ron Cohen was a professor that, that served uh, for decades at Bennington um, from before the purge, which is an event I'll get to later, through the purge, he survived it, and he taught uh, through the 2000s. And sadly, he passed away uh, this month. Basically, the work that he contributed to was a study, a case study of the first generation of uh, Bennington students, the first women who were at the school. What they found was <clears throat> socio-political attitudes, for the most part, of young adults going into college are are at that point in time uh, still incredibly malleable. But for the most part the changes to your socio-political attitudes that happen at school, at college, for the most part, stay with you through your lifetime. The, the attitudes that are fostered <clears throat> at school stay with you. So this, this begs the question today, especially given the climate of democracy in America at this current moment, what are the responsibilities of colleges to teach responsible democracy to students. We know that the attitudes fostered today at school are going to, are going to stay with students. So what are the responsibilities and what socio-political attitudes uh, are Bennington fostering right now as it has systematically dismantled every aspect of democracy it commenced with? Uh, before I launch into a review of this history, I want to explain uh, just briefly how I became invested in this issue personally. Um, I graduated Bennington in 2018. My dad graduated in 83, <clears throat> back when this policy was, was written. So I grew, up, I grew up with the soul and the philosophy of Bennington as the sort of educational and democratic goal. When I came to Bennington in 2014, I was, I was confronted with a, an administrative attitude and uh, the voice of an authority more like this, which, ha which does not require consent or presence or uh, even your knowledge to, to enter your room. I can remember really clearly um, attending an event at, at a parent uh, weekend that, that Marco, the then president, was hosting. And she went to great pains to explain, ev evidently thinking that the parents were worried, uh, that the Bennington of then, 2014, was not the Bennington of the past. Have no fear, this is the new Bennington. This is Bennington heading forward. We're not the Bennington of the past. This was, it struck me as an incredibly odd statement because the Bennington of the past, that's what Bennington owes its entire reputation to. When you talk about Bennington of the past, you talk about community government. And um, you, I'll just mention some of the names that have come through there. Martha Graham, Helen Frankenthaler, W.H. Auden, 
Bernard Malamud, Kenneth Burke, Judith Butler, Stanley Kunitz, uh, Joe McGinnis, Brady Snellis, Donna Tart, Jill Eisenstadt, Jonathan Latham. Obviously, something was going right in Bennington's past. I, I was confused why we should why we should um, be ashamed of that. My freshman year continued, and I I made the deepest and closest relationship I've ever had with another person with Hadil, um, and and actually we became friends. We on the first day we met each other, and we became friends like instantly. There's no growing period. It just somehow the friendship was was already there, um, and she she really changed my life, and she changed my outlook on uh, on life and on democracy. Um, she was a conflict resolution student at Bennington. She created a consortium of uh, Sarah Lawrence, Vassar, Bard, and Bennington to deal with refugee and, and migrant issues in the Middle East. Um, and a week before Christmas in 2016, she took her own life. And as anyone who's affected by suicide, you know that there's this kind of unentangleable anguish and sadness of, of guilt and wondering why and, and all these questions. Um, her name in Arabic means, Hadil means the, the sound of a messenger bird. And because she had changed my life so much, I felt I owed it to her to see where that message came from, uh, where it originated from. So after I graduated Bennington, I went to, I went to Palestine, uh, where Hadil was from. I went to Bethlehem in the West Bank. Um, and I did some reporting for, for some news outlets. But, but basically it was here that I learned the importance of democracy and what happens when there's an absence of not just democracy, but of human rights. While I was there, I spent about 40 days there. While I was there, 30 uh, men in the village that I was staying in, a very small village in Bethlehem, uh, were detained in the middle of the night with no warrant, no charges, and uh, they were blindfolded, handcuffed. And even with some of these cases, um, the fo photos of them present in the house uh, were detained, were taken. So families weren't even left with images of, of these people. Um, this, from what you're looking at, this is one of the uh, separation walls. Hadil grew up in Palestine, Palestine, right next to the separation wall. This is taken from a terrace. So I had to, um, I had to go to Palestine to real, realize the importance of democracy and, and, the, and the military totalitarian control that was going on here. Um, struck me th th this is the reality that is waiting on the other side of, of failed democracy um, this is what happens when when any democracy fails you get legislation and action by force and you don't get participation by citizens there are no protections this is what happens when there are no protections for people in any system so after 40 days you know i I get to go home to a democracy, albeit one that's that's in decline. But but uh, I get to go. Meanwhile, these children, who of course have no choice where they're born, no choice who they're born as, have to keep living in this. That is, of course, putting it lightly. Anyways, I went back. I went back for Christmas, and uh, about a week later, I went up to Bennington to help out a friend who was another international student. She had broken her ankle. She was waiting for her passport to come in because she needed a student visa uh, to, to study abroad the next term. And um, the school, aware of all of this, was kicking her off campus, had rejected her um, the ability to stay on campus, at least until her passport came in. And the passport was being sent to Bennington. So I drove up on New Year's Eve to pick her up and drive her back to my house and host her until her passport came in. It being New Year's Eve, as all human beings do, we celebrated it. But the reality for many international students and students of lower income at Bennington is that they have to do their uh, fieldwork terms on campus. They, they have to stay at Bennington. And because of heating costs and whatnot, um, they're all put into one house on campus. This time around, the house was Bingham. What was new this year, or that year of 2019 was that the administration had decided that it, it was unfair for um, the students who, who lived in Bingham House fall and spring term to have to move out all of their stuff or to lug them to storage. So all of the people living in Bingham, the international students and students of lower income, were forced to live out of suitcases for three months um, and were not allowed to use their closets. Their closets were locked. Um, and three months is just about the same length of time as the semester. Anyways, uh, my friend and I, we went to Bingham and we, uh, we were hanging out with another friend of ours 
uh, also uh, an international student from Armenia, Mira. We were talking about issues of human rights and democracy, and Mira mentioned that she was, you know, she was inspired by some of the work that Hadil had done, and she wanted to do something similar back home at Armenia, uh, in Armenia. Um, anyways, as we were celebrating, as most, as most human beings do for New Year's Eve, a campus security guard was, was walking through the house. Maybe he didn't realize what holiday it was, but uh, he found Mira's door ajar, slightly left open. And pursuant to that right of entry policy that was crafted by administration, he waltzed right in. And uh, what he saw shocked him. Mira was using her closet. Mira had asked the person whose room it was in the fall and spring if she could put hanger clothes in the closet and not drape them over the, the near servant, the surface. And the student um, agreed, consented. So she also had an ashtray in her room and the campus security guard wasted no time writing these up. And the next day, Mira received an email that she had to meet with uh, an administrator to talk about uh, these egregious violations of community standards that had deeply endangered the community at large. Um, I drove home and, and later I, I kept talking to Mira about this and, and learned about this. The administrator looked Mira in the eyes and said, I don't want to be responsible for you anymore. And gave Mira 72 hours to find alternative housing and to, to move off campus. She was not allowed on campus for field work time because she was using her closet. What you, have, what you have here is you have a, you had a, com a complete breakdown in any sort of community government. There was no judicial oversight was called. Students were not participating in this. Students hadn't crafted the community standard violation and Mira was, was, was suffering from, from that, all those lacks. She failed her fieldwork term, which impinged on whether or not she might be able to graduate in the spring. And two months later in April, she took her own life. Now look, it's not for me to tell you why someone, point blank, why someone would make this decision. I can't tell you why someone would make, another human being would make any other decision in their lives. It's, it's only a question that those who loved Mira the most deeply can ask themselves privately. But what I can tell you is that in a five-year period, Bennington College has had three suicides from international students and two attempted suicides which is well above the national average on college campuses the national average which takes into account all demographics of students at universities the the suicide rate amongst international students is higher than that national average i can also tell you that after this event international students took it upon themselves to form a task force Seeing that the college was failing to protect them was more than reluctant to make any sort of changes to their policies. International students formed a task force that eventually forced the school to investigate the administrator who had disciplined Mira without any sort of judicial oversight or communal oversight. And even now, <coughs> Even now, despite this, despite this uptick in suicides, the school really, the school can't pretend to care about what's happening. Right now, we have senior, um, at Bank, on Bankton campus, we have senior international students who are being given until May 31st to move off campus. A lot of, of international workers are essential workers on Bankton campus, and they've had their, the work that they do in the spring either completely cut or cut back to something like seven hours a week. So that the finances that they were expecting to make in the spring are not there. They're being released into a global pandemic, the international seniors, and the school can't even send out an email asking for aid, asking for donations to help the soon to be homeless members of the Bennington community in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic, a pandemic that cannot be planned for in advance. We get emails every other day about the barn, but we get nothing about asking for donations for, for, this, for these members of the community. Meanwhile, the students, because the administration has refused to take part in this, students have created their own fund and 
is speaking to the overwhelming incompetence of the school, which I'm even reluctant to call malicious, because even if they were malicious, they would maybe see a PR upside to asking for donations for members of their community coming around the, um, the international students in a time of crisis. This, the fund students have created, in the first four to five hours, raised nearly $10,000 Although I, 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 I take that back. This is an attempt of the school to pretend to care. This was sent out by the administrator who was involved in the decision to discipline Mira for the egregious act of using her own closet. April being, of course, the one-year anniversary of Mira's suicide. Again, an action of discipline uh, that I saw firsthand being there when it happened. First of all, the administrator informed everybody that they were experiencing uh, collective grief. And just in case anyone had any objections, the administrator linked to a uh, Harvard Business Review article to prove it. Um, and then went on to conflate the collective grief uh, that was being claimed ab uh, about Mira without mentioning Mira. The collective grief that was being alluded to, conflate that with the collective grief of the COVID-19 pandemic, saying, this difficult time, the impact of the ways in which our lives have changed in order to protect our most vulnerable community members and ourselves have been accompanied by a great loss. This is patronizing to the highest degree and a morally bankrupt statement coming from somebody who does not protect the most vulnerable members of the Bennington community, which are the non-citizens, the non-legal resident aliens. That's the official designation for international students. Bennington College does not protect its most vulnerable community members. And to try in a show of good faith, claim that that's what everyone is doing, it's not just patronizing, it's, it's insulting. It's insulting to the intelligence of the people that are there. It's, deep, it's deeply insulting to the vulnerable members of the community who have suffered under this administration. To then be told that, that the vulnerable members of the community are being protected in any way during this, it's a hollow, meaningless posturing that, that really has no place at Bennington College. And administrators who uphold this have no place at Bennington College. And it, it is patronizing to send out a letter like this when you have international students that for seven years have been asking for certain changes and have not gotten them. And you are releasing international students out into the unprecedented horrors of a global pandemic that has no promise of abating. And you've done nothing to, to try and help them or ease that transition. Authoritarian, disciplinarian, totalitarian, whatever Terran you want, it always reveals itself under <clears throat> the veil of a free environment uh, with the way that they treat the most vulnerable members of the community. I want to just read one last thing. Uh, it's the last paragraph here. If you are concerned about yourself, a student, a classmate, or a coworker, please reach out. I'm doing this talk because I am deeply concerned. I am deeply concerned about the Bennington community, about Bennington students. And I am reaching out and I'm deeply concerned about a college that has stopped reviewing itself and asking the community, what is wrong with Bennington? What is not working? How can we change? And to an administration that looked into Mira's eyes and said, I don't want to be responsible for you. I'm here to tell you, you are responsible for the well-being of your students and you're responsible to the history and the foundation of the college, which has been completely, completely debauched. It started with this. It started with this, with this policy for Mira. And I want to talk now how we got from this to this. Um, the idea of Bennington originated in the 20s and it, it survived the Great Depression. The idea of it survived the Great Depression um, and it broke ground in 1932. And when it did, all uh, the eyes of America and the eyes of higher education was on it because it was truly a radical um, experiment in higher education. That is not, that's not an exaggeration. Back then it was an experiment in higher education. And it commenced with a living, breathing constitution built on, um, built on its ideals. Um, one of the insights of, of Bennington 
uh, besides the fact that students should be able to chart their own course, not have required classes, not have uh, set majors, um, it was, the insight was that learning was not confined to the classroom. And actually, the bulk of learning takes place um, through your experience in the community. This was one of the, this was half, exactly half of the, found, of the reason for the founding um, of the college. Um, one of the best primary sources for understanding this is this book by Barbara Jones, who was an economics professor at Bennington College from the beginning. She wrote this book, um, which was authorized and sanctioned by the college. Uh, it's a study of the college and the development. And it was also funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, just to give you an idea of what kind of sort of uh, philanthropic wealth even was behind Bennington. Um, she wrote this in 1946, and I think I want to read a little bit of you, a, a little bit of it to you guys to, to show to, to show you what, um, to explain uh, those principles. No description of the Bennington College curriculum would be adequate if it left out that important part of education which takes place outside the classroom. These chapters will therefore describe the community life, which has always been regarded as an integral part of the program, embodying the same educational principles as the academic work. The general educational objectives of this practical part of the curriculum can be summarized as training in responsible citizenship in accordance with the values of social and political democracy. Political training includes learning how to elect intelligently, training in reasonable methods of settling disputes, getting the relevant facts and basing decisions on evidence rather than prejudice, and learning to recognize the proper role of the expert in government. It must be remembered, however, that the community is not a pedagogical device, like a model League of Nations assembly, but the real thing. Students, faculty, and staff are engaged in the necessary and immediate job of managing community affairs, and there is no hidden administrative control behind the scenes. Because all important committees of student government are joint faculty committees, the faculty and student and administrative members function at large, not as representatives of interest groups. If it, Bennington, is to avoid what might be called the horrors of institutional personnel, careful thought must also be given to the quality of its community life as it affects teachers as well as students. One overall characteristic of the administration is its unobtrusiveness. There were some um, <clears throat> additional uh, concerns and, and uh, awarenesses of the people who put Bennington into practice in, in the 30s and who continued to practice it for at least its first 60 years. And one of these was to avoid at all costs concerns about the way they govern themselves from the outside world. There was a sharp division made between the way the outside might want Bennington to function, the realities of the outside, um, between that and the realities of, of inside the campus. All directions of community governance was directed from inside and through, through cooperative democratic bodies. I'll read uh, from Barbara Jones. The college has never taken refuge in a safe set of rules which would calm the fears of parents and protect the community from outside criticism. Outside criticism is a secondary concern as it too often reflects people's idea, idea, ideas sorry, of what a girls' school or college should make its students do rather than what young people feel is right or actually do at home. The policy has always been to allow the students as a group to make their own decisions, trying to bring out in discussion all the considerations involved, including that of reputation, but never pressing for restrictions which the students feel to be unjustified. The process of self-government seems to have greater educational value for democratic citizenship than would a system of rules and penalties imposed and enforced by the college administration. Human history affords no evidence that young people have ever behaved as their elders would like them to, in spite of repressive measures to make them conform. Another deep awareness which we've talked about, um, in which the founders of Bennington College didn't have to wait for uh, the work of Ron Cohen to come out to understand, <clears throat> was that what, how they structured the community would have lasting effects on the social habits and the ways of thinking of its individual members. Um, so let's just explore for, for a second, um, how the first six generations of Bennington students, faculty, and staff constructed their governance. There are constitutions of the 30s, but the way Barbara Jones references going about getting them, I think, is, is defunct at, at this point in time. But I'm sure that they still exist uh, in the archives. 
<clears throat> so the only versions that we have available online, by the way, all of this is available online. All these constitutions, all these documents are available online on the Bankton archives. The first one we can start with is 1942. Um, we have here uh, the community defined quite accurately as the body consisting of students, faculty, and staff, um, and the constitution, the governance uh, deriving from the community defined that as such. Here we see house chairs are elected by house members, which might be a shock to some people, to some current students at Bennington. When I was a freshman, house chairs were also elected, but that's one of the uh, silent changes that have, have happened. And they could be removed at any time by a vote of no confidence. Um, and this iteration, we have what was called a central committee, which was a body comprised of two students elected by the house chairs. Um, and the director of student personnel, they were in charge of defining the standards of the college and dealing with violations. This body, for instance, would be charged with determining uh, what discipline was appropriate for maybe a student, I don't know, using their own closet or something like that. The way they defined standards would be approved by what was called the college council. The college council was comprised of delegates from the house chairs, one student member of the central committee, the director of student personnel and student delegates from all the various committees at Bennington. And back then there was a lot. There was the Recreational Council, the Health Committee, uh, SEPC, which still exists, but its domain is, is relegated to academics, um, General Meetings Committee, um, and, the, and the president of the college. So you see already the bodies are mostly comprised of students, the ones writing standards, um, the ones approving it, and the ones um, conducting, um, adjudicating if someone has violated a standard. It is student-based. There's also a measure here that, that um, specifies how any standard can be uh, amended or overridden by the community. Any 10% of the community that desires to revoke or amend a rule may present a signed petition stating its proposals in writing to the College Council. If the College Council does not accept the proposal of any 10% of the community, it must call a community meeting which shall act upon the proposal of the petitioners. The community, community decision is controlling, in other words, binding. <clears throat> so just, just to recap here, we have, uh, we have full-blown representative democracy, 1942. We have student suffrage in terms of policy crafting, house chairs, and we have the community gathered together as the binding sovereign voice. Um, in 46, the year that Barbara Jones wrote her study, we see these in, in even um, explained in even broader and more democratic terms. Um, and we, we see things shifting, we see policy shifting, we see democracy working. Um, I don't have time to run through all the specifications of these documents, but um, the College Council was greatly expanded to be more democratic. Instead of having delegates from house chairs, you had every member was elected by uh, the community. You still had the 10%. Um, veto petition power <clears throat> the community still gathered was the um was the binding sovereign voice uh you still had the right of redress and at this point in time um it was instituted that every rule and regulation every community standard was posted uh once a year and the community would gather as a whole and vote upon it so the final votes of the the rules and regulations and the community standards was 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 uh you know, an example of direct democracy it was voted on by the entire community and the majority vote was binding. In 56, we, we see democracy continuing to work. We see the same things <clears throat> being kept here. And we, we see it working where um, some of the councils and the committees are simplified into, into um, smaller groups, but more democratic groups. And I, I will make these documents um, available to anyone who, who really wants to study these as uh, as models of um, democracy this is from this is from the 60s um, this is the time that Bennington started to give out student handbooks this is on the very first page of the student handbook and I'll, I'll read it to you as in any institution certain rules and regulations are essential to the exercise of individual responsibility because they protect the community from instances of individual abuse or neglect of that responsibility an attempt has been made to keep rules and regulations at a minimum and those that do exist are open to continual reappraisal. Since all students are asked to endorse any changes or continuations of policy, the present standards are included at the end of this handbook. Every student is urged to examine them carefully so that she, at this time the school was a um, all women's college, 
so that she may understand what the current community expectations are and so that she may participate fully in any discussion or revision of them. Also included in the handbook is the Bennington College Community Constitution, written by a faculty student committee. Familiarity with this document will help greatly in understanding the structure and workings of the college. With the exception of those parts dealing with faculty and administrative policy, the handbook is largely the work of students and reflects what they themselves think is important to know about life at Bennington. In 1975, we see nothing, we see really nothing um, altered. I mean, geez, these people, these, the first practitioners at Bennington College must have really believed in what the college was, was founded for because we see it defended and we see it reaffirmed through, through all of the decades. <clears throat> what changes, I'll run you through just um, uh, a few quick changes. Um, the petition, um, the percentage of students required to petition or amend any uh, rule was raised to 15%. But also at the same time, uh, any voter turnout less than 25% was considered null and void, which was an inducement to the community to participate in the crafting of policies. Any voter turnout less than 25% meant that these policies were not going to go we're not gonna be binding on the community because the, the community had not voted on them. They cared about community participation back then. You do start to see here we, um, one, one development. What happened here in 1975 is that the college faced its first uh, sort of financial crisis. Um, and the board of trustees wanted to make some changes that would be extra constitutional that would be outside of the way the Constitution governed, the way those changes should, should happen. So this provision was, was slipped in, which gave the president basically the authority to recommend any changes that they felt in a crisis needed to be made to, to save the college. However, at the same time, if, if there were going to be any changes made by the president that was outside of the constitutional dic dictates, um, it had to be reported to the community government and it had to be reported to the board of trustees. There had to be transparency if something was gonna change. The information I have on this comes from a report by the Association of American University Professors um, on, the events, on the events here. And, and it's believed that these events led to uh, the purge of the 90s in 1994. Um, basically, the, the uh, board of trustees created an ad hoc body that made recommendations of terminating 12 faculty, con, uh, discontinuing foreign language, reorganizing the academic divisions, uh, increasing the amount of students, and getting rid of presumptive tenure, which was Bennington's unique version of tenure. It was, uh, it was essentially tenure, but they were they were rolling they were rolling blocks of, of five years. Every five years, you were up for another five years, but pretty much, um, if you had already been voted in, you you were gonna you were guaranteed almost tenure but there was wiggle room just in case the administration wanted to move on. Um, the faculty in 1975, they made an incredibly decisive resistance to this. Um, you know, many of the faculty here were, were people who came of age or got their political chops in, in the late 60s, in the social movements of the late 60s. Um, when the recommendations were made to them, which would have gone outside of the constitution and which would have bypassed faculty power, uh, they expelled the board from their faculty meeting to, to receive its final report. They rejected the recommendations and they voted no confidence in the president of Bennington College, Dr. Gail Thane Parker, which, which forced her to resign. The, so in the first attack of sort of constitutional authority um, and due process, um, the Constitution was protected. The faculty made a decisive resistance and they asserted power and control, um, which, which created a resentment in the Board of Trustees, which nurtured itself over two decades and eventually led to, um, it reared its ugly head 20 years later. So I wanna recap, I don't have time to get into, into the 80s here, but I wanna use 1981 as a recap point to to go over what remained of the Bennington Social Compact from the year it was founded in 1932 through the 80s. You have cooperative constitutional democracy, the community, meaning students, faculty, and staff together in bodies, <clears throat> ratifies, crafts, and decides community standards, and all college procedures are bound to the Constitution, which is made public and which is subject to change based on uh, democratic voting. 
you have transparency. You have students participating in policy crafting. They, they know what's happening. And these meetings that would happen with uh, college councils, for instance, they were all, the minutes of them were written up and um, were uh, passed out through the, made public, passed out to the entire college. You have right to dissent. 10 to 15% percentage of the community can petition or amend any policy that governs them. And the, the community together is the sovereign voice. The majority vote of the community together decides the direction of the school. And also uh, something I forgot to mention was uh, in 1946, the definition of the community was enlarged to include um, workers. So like the essential workers that are keeping Bennington afloat right now, were able to also gather um, at these moments um, and vote. Your voter turnout at anything less than 25% is considered null and void, which would be bad news for any house chair that it, that is there today because no one has, no students have, vo have voted for them. Um, and you have student suffrage. In 1994, you have, this is the moment when Bennington changes radically. It reaffirmed, it reaffirms some um, tenets of the original social compact, but it, it changes radically. And it, it is what has led to uh, the Bennington that, that is today. Um, and it's, it's probably the most infamous time in, in Bennington history. It began, of course, back in 1975 with, uh, with the assertion of power of faculty and, and students together. Um, and in 1992, uh, the board claimed another budgetary crisis was, was coming. And there were legitimate uh, budgetary and fiscal concerns. The tuition revenue was falling. Operational costs were rising. Student body had dropped from 600 to 485. And uh, the president, Elizabeth Coleman, who was appointed in 1987, received a cautionary letter from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, which accredits institutions. And also, as a side note, Bennington is, is up for accreditation uh, this year. Um, so what the Board of Trustees did was they appointed a steering committee of administrators, faculty, and even student delegates to recommend changes to stave off basically the death of, of the school. And for the most part, they accepted their changes, but they they were still pushing for the changes that, that they wanted back in 1975 that the faculty resisted. They wanted the end of presumptive tenure um, and they wanted to reorganize the academic divisions and they couldn't do it based on the, the um, governmental functioning of, of the school. They couldn't go outside of it. Um, what happened was that, uh, that term, there was tons of student protests knowing knowing what the Board of Trustees was trying to push. Um, and <clears throat> the Board of Trustees uh, sort of, it reached a breaking point with the faculty. And there's a lot of faculty pushback, especially among the, liter among the literature and languages uh, group division. Um, students protested, they went on strike, they occupied the president's office um, with the support of faculty. In 1992, the board met, and they had at that point reached a breaking point with faculty, a breaking point based on the resentment of the power that faculty and students together, united together, were showing. They rejected recommendations of reappointments of faculty by Bennington faculty members, and they, they rejected recommendations of presumptive tenure, even with Liz Coleman's um, approval of those recommendations. They had reached a breaking point with faculty where they were no longer comfortable with the power that the faculty wielded. And they began questioning the very constitutional structures of the school. Um, they, they called for meetings called the symposium. There was, a, there was a very pervasive environment of fear, anger, and confusion on campus in, um, in the fall at that point. Um, they called the symposium, which was open to the public. It was inclusive, but it was explicitly made known that it was not consensual whatever suggestions were being made by faculty or students in these meetings um, were not binding on the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees claimed that they had sole um, authority to determine policy. And the symposium talks were led by Liz Coleman, and uh, here she is, I think, taking herself a little too seriously, thinking that she is the philosopher king um, from Plato's Republic. Um, in, uh, in January of 1994, the symposium talks plummeted. Um, they were seen as being pretextual because everyone basically knew the Board of Trustees had already decided what they wanted to do and they were really just looking for some sort of legitimacy, some way to, le to legitimize what they were about to do. 
in January of 94, they declared privately without faculty participation that there was a fiscal exigency. And a fiscal exigency is, it's much different than just financial straits. It means that the financial situation of an institution is so bad, so dire that its very existence depends on swift action and extra constitutional action. Oddly enough, they didn't, um, they didn't reveal any of this until uh, June of 1994. They declared it privately in 94, and they didn't reveal it until June of 94 when all the faculty and students had already uh, left campus. During this summer, they radically rewrote the recommendations, uh, the, sorry, the requirements for faculty, um, and they sent out notices terminating 27 faculty members, a third of the entire faculty, many of whom served on governance boards like the FPC, Faculty Policy Committee, and were powerful in the community, especially members that were vocally critical of Liz Coleman and the Board of Trustees. The thing is, the, the school never provided documentation that there was a fiscal exigency. They declared, they, they declared that they needed to um, seize power in this rare temporary emergency moment to save the college's life, <clears throat> but they never provided documentation that that proved that, that justified it. And according to the AAUP, which was the only body that investigated this, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that suggests that there wasn't a fiscal exigency, that there was, financial, there was a financial crisis and there were problems, but it uh, wasn't bad enough to justify what, what the school did. They used it as a pretext basically to, to radically reorganize the school, to impose a new orthodoxy in the school. Um, and it was the AAUP that referred to this moment as the purge and a coup, and they referred to it that way as well. What they announced during this time was a, uh, a radical um, addition of, of administrators. So the faculty was plummeting. They, they were reducing the demographic of faculty, and they were increasing the demographic of administrators, basically as a, as a buffer, as a way to protect the board of trustees. Now, if this was a real a fiscal emergency, what would have happened is the, these implementations would have been put in place and then the school would have returned to the way it had always functioned. That you, it, we wouldn't need to be stuck in this, um, in this structure for 25 years later. The fiscal exigencies don't last that long. They're, they are, they're momentary. Liz Coleman, the president, remade student government and community government over in, in her own image. This is the first time in a student handbook that a president ever put their photo on the front page, you know, because why not, just in case you had any confusion, really, who was, who was running the show. Um, and what she did was she separated faculty and student community uh, governance uh, committees um, because they, it's students and faculty who have, um, who have shared, shared interest. If they're fragmented, uh, there's less power that can be drummed up from the bottom and there's more power that can be um, executed from the top, from the administration. Student government, community government, became uh, student council. This is when you see the machinations of, of neoliberalism, you know, working their magic. Student council became a advisory board. It was a way of giving, again, the pretext, a pretext. This is what neoliberalism loves, is pretext of, of things. This is a pretext of student government. This is kids pretending to play democracy, but really they're an advisory board, quote unquote. So they reach decisions and they suggest to, to Liz, hey, you know, why don't you do this? And she, of course, has total authority to dismiss all of it. There's, n there's nothing binding on her. There's no democracy anymore. The Constitution's been thrown out. The, there's no more constitutional say or suffrage or power in the hands of students and faculty. Um, what was created here was a bureaucracy, and the thing about a bureaucracy is that it needs to expand. A, a bureaucracy needs to expand. That is the lifeblood of its very existence. The people inside of it, the career administrators, who majored in such studies antithetical to Bennington's academics like leadership and communications, they need to collect their salaries. They need to keep their jobs, and they keep their jobs by expanding their reach, by making themselves relevant, and you only make yourselves relevant in a bureaucracy by expanding power. 
um, you get people who aren't drawn to the school because of the educational principles, but because they are collecting salaries, they are staking out a career. And this was, this was a fundamental change to uh, the school in general. Despite all these changes through the Liz Coleman administration, students for the most part still governed themselves. Faculty power had, had dwindled, but students um, still could make certain key decisions for themselves. What's happened since then is what you have is just like how World War I led to World War II, and in that way they are the same event, really, the same historical moment. You have the, we have the purge of, of 1994 leading to um, what I've called the silent purge, just as equally nefarious, detrimental um, declines uh, in Bennington's uh, program. The purge, which the entirety of its uh, the changes it ushered in, uh, which were based off of uh, a, a momentary emergency um, financial exigency, created a vacuum after Liz Coleman left, after the de facto dictator Bennington left, created a vacuum in which the bureaucracy of Bennington, the bureaucracy that she and the Board of Trustees created, have been able to wreak havoc without any pretext, without any financial exigency pretext, just on their own volition, just on the, the volition of the nature of a bureaucracy. So the changes that have happened under Mariko Silver are just as much, uh, can just as much be attributed, attributed to her as they can to uh, the admin inside of the barn as a collective. There's no documentation given, of course, uh, over this time period. Um, even the purge of 1994, they at least put out a symposium report. They had the, re the respect, I guess, um, to, to make public, to try and justify what changes they were making. Today, we have an equally nefarious um, purging of student powers with no, with no announcements, no, no publicity to it, no, no attempts to justify what, what is being done. And there's no, and of course, there's no constitution anymore. There's no, there's no responsibility of the administration to follow the democratic heelstones that governed and saw Bennington through its first six decades, six very successful decades. So what's happened since then? There is no more student government body. There's no body on campus comprised of students or students and faculty that crafts policy that governs students in the community. We have SEPC, which students can vote for representatives there to try their best to influence academic policy, but there's no more communal government in which students can participate. The community standards that govern them, they have no ability, ability to assent dissent against, or, and there's no avenue of redress. There's no longer a guarantee that you'll be tried by your peers. The Judicial Committee, which was created in 1975, was originally composed of exclusively students, and now it is a, it's a hollowed out form that's not, that's not even called in, in, every, uh, in every case. For instance, the expulsion of Mira from campus for using her closet and possessing an ashtray, which is a violation of fire code, not community standards, by the way. There was no judicial oversight. There was no student participation. There was just the... Um, the discipline allocated by one administrator <clears throat> who, who runs her operation like, like Bennington College is the RMV, who can't see gray areas, only black and white. House chairs are not elected anymore. They're, they're handpicked by the administration. The students, these are the students responsible, the last remaining students responsible for representing the concerns of their fellow students to the administration in lieu of any governing body as well as the students who represent and disseminate information for the administration to the students, they are not elected by students, but they're handpicked by the administration. As I said, in 2014, when I was a freshman, we voted for our house chairs. When I was a sophomore, we, uh, we filled out questionnaires on them. We didn't pass a vote. And when I was a junior, we weren't asked anymore. This, this typifies the silent, gradual loss of freedom as there is no student government body to have any oversight and to prevent changes like this. We have the complete elimination of suffrage. There's nothing anymore that Bennington students can, can vote on. The student, uh, Bennington students cannot 
participate in crafting the community standards that govern them. They, they can't participate in anything any longer. There's nothing to vote on. They can't even name <clears throat> um, their Friday night parties. It has to be approved by the administration. I mean, this is insane. This is really a bureaucracy that is really reaching. It, uh, as I said, the bureaucracy needs to expand. It has to, and every year it expands an inch further. The, the trend that this is going in is that there won't be Friday night parties anymore. <clears throat> Students will have to get permission to assemble in numbers greater than 40 or whatever the fire code policy is. That, that also dwindles every year. There's no transparency at all. All throughout the first six, de six decades of Bennington, there was complete transparency. Policy formation happened out in the open. Meetings for the councils that crafted policy were written up and disseminated to the public. <clears throat> it doesn't exist anymore because there's no constitution that, that makes the administration responsible to announce any changes to, to uh, students. And what's been more shocking really is a change in attitude of the administration and particularly student life towards students. It was once the expectation that there should be no need for punishment when dealing with students who might um, violate a community standard. When I was a freshman, we had a senior who had something like 53 write-ups. Today, one write-up is enough to put you on probation. It doesn't matter. The, the expectation today is discipline. You, you have that is what you are. That's that is what is is waiting for you, and you have no due process that can protect you. You have no oversight anymore. So what have these changes? What have these changes led to? In the chain of events, these all these policy changes have have led to policies like this, and have led in a chain of events to the suicide of at least one Bennington College student, a member of the most vulnerable demographic on campus. Mira. Given the current climate of America right now, we have, uh, we have protesters out who are, they think that they're protesting for states' rights, but they've been inspired to do it by the head of a federal government, and they're actually protesting states' rights working. Uh, we, we have an electorate right now who's, whose heads are tied in pretzels. We have bad citizenship. We have, we have bad habits of citizenship. We have a democracy that, that is declining. This raises the question, what is the responsibility of colleges to teach responsible democracy to students? And what socio-political attitudes are being fostered right now at Bennington among students as it has systematically dismantled every aspect of democracy that it commenced with? One, um, all of the students who have the right, they're of legal age to vote in any state or national election, they're not trusted or worthy of making their own choices in their community, electing their own representatives, or performing the rights of, of a free citizen in the college that was founded explicitly to allow for the demonstration and practice and participation of human and democratic rights. The rights of the students before the ones today do not belong to current students. And this is under the banner of a radical progressive education. This is what Bennington considers itself. This is not progress. Number two, the only way, uh, legitimate way to rise in your community and to represent your peers or have any share in the power or authority in the community is not by the respect, the consent, or the election of the peers you represent, but by the, sel the selection of a fixed group of superiors in the administration out of view of the public eye and who live outside the community. To be, to be a representative of your peers, you have to best represent the administration standards of what a leader should be during selection process, not the standards of your community, which Barbara Jones was, was, when at, was at pains to point out was the lifeblood of the living, breathing Bennington democracy, the infusion of what students, what this, the standards of what uh, students thought the standards ought to be. Number three, aloofness really is your only hope, okay? You can only live <clears throat> without fear of, of egregious discipline, so long as you conform to rules that you have no right to assent or dissent against, and no ability to redress or participate in the crafting of. It's not you, your life, or your well-being that matters, but that you follow the institution's rules, which are constantly becoming more invasive and are changing all the time and do not have to be announced to you for you to have broken them. I mean, these are deeply cynical attitudes toward democracy to be fostering in the year 2020. 
1932, when, when the, vote, the voting age in America was 21, students at Bennington could vote and took active participation in the community. Today, the voting age is 18 and students have nothing to vote on. Bennington is actively teaching the antithesis of good habits of a, of a, of a citizen in a democracy, right when democracy <clears throat> is at its most crucial stage in American history. We have the most crucial election coming up in November that modern America has, has ever seen. Every time Bennington speaks about community building and growth, it is completely hollow and it is completely meaningless. I, I want to believe that, um, I give the benefit of the doubt to the administration and believe that they don't personally support voter suppression uh, in their politics, but you'd have no, absolutely no idea by the way they, they've, com they've viciously attacked every remnant of Bennington democracy and its constitution over the last decades. This is Bennington in name alone. The college that sits on the campus of One College Drive has become, in many key important ways, the exact college that Bennington was founded to refute, renounce, and offer an alternative to. The Bennington experiment was, which is a phrase you hear a lot on campus, and which I forgot to mention in the beginning, um, was to see how successful a school could be under a cooperative democratic environment in which the community together operates and charts the direction of the school. It wasn't to see how long it would take to dismantle um, every aspect of the constitution. The experiment wasn't to see, gee, I wonder how long it will take until this school represents everything that we founded Bennington not to ever be. I think this is the time that, that everyone in higher education needs to revisit um, the work brought up by Ron Cohen and uh, to, to, to try and make their campuses models of uh, good citizenship. <clears throat> and I think Bennington, especially right now, the way it's between presidents, it's up for accreditation. It needs to revisit Bennington's original charters, its original constitution. It needs to revisit Bennington's original desire, which was to teach responsible citizenship. And I think Bennington, if it's going to survive this pandemic, if it's going to survive into the future, it needs to remake itself as a model going forward of what democracy on college campuses should be. Until then, I think really out of respect for a college that uh, the administration has so obscenely mangled um, and out of respect for the first six decades of careful, competent practitioners, uh, it would be best for the college to stop speaking about any sort of Bennington experiment going up on one college drive, not until the conditions of the experiment are reinstituted. Thank you. The phrase, the Bennington experiment, is one that you hear a lot on campus. But make no mistake, there is no more experiment going on. On, on, the, on the college that sits on one campus drive. The experiment was to see how successful could the school be under this environment, in this environment of a free, cooperative, democratic body. The experiment wasn't to see how long it would take to dismantle every, every founding aspect of the school. This, the, the college that sits on the campus today is Bennington in name alone. It is the very college that Bennington was founded to refute, renounce, and offer an alternative to. This stage in American history and at this juncture in American democracy, and at this juncture in Bennington history, the school needs to return and recommit to uh, constitutional government. And, and not because it's uh, maybe a good idea or because it to survive the pandemic, it needs to maybe make some radical changes. They need to recommit because this is the duty. This is the duty of people who work at Bennington. This is the responsibility of being a part of Bennington. Let's, let's return the eyes of higher education to the campus of Bennington College, and let's bring this back to what it was.